we're looking at the longest running motorcycle models of all time. So basically motorcycles that were released and they just kept making them for years and years and decades and decades. So for this one, I struggled to find very many articles that really supplemented what I kind of already knew as the longest running motorcycles. There were a few that I didn't know, uh, like the first one we're going to talk about. Uh, but yeah, you're kind of just getting what I know in this video. With that being said, if there's any that I missed that do belong in the top 10 here, let us know down below in the comments. And if there's any big ones that you guys mentioned that, like I said, should be in the top 10, I'll pin your comment so that people can know that. So watch the video and check out the comments as well. Also, just a side note, I'm focusing mainly on street bikes, not dirt bikes. I know there have been quite a few dirt bike platforms that have been around for a very long time, but yeah, my focus is more on street bikes. So let's jump in. Number 10 on my list goes to the Honda CG125, a little bike produced from Honda from about 1976 through 2007, so about 31 years if my math is correct. Honda has a long history of 125cc little singles. Even today, it seems like this is Honda's preferred flavor for small displacement machines. Now, the CG125 was essentially a CB125, but it was really made for developing countries. The whole goal was another level of reliability and durability. The kind of bike that people could just use and use and use. The biggest difference between the CB and CG was the top end. The CG125 utilized a pushrod system instead of an overhead cam like the CB125 that a lot of us know about. And it went through many different iterations over those 31 years, but it essentially stayed the same in its DNA. It was a small, durable little motorcycle that was affordable and it just worked. And for that reason, it really was a workhorse for riders all over the world. Such a durable platform. This bike basically spawned the small displacement motorcycle production of many modern Chinese manufacturers. They would take this engine that already existed and basically make their own version of it with sometimes even higher displacement, but they would use cheaper parts and even still with less premium sort of care than what you get from the Japanese manufacturing. These Chinese 125s and 200s still proved to be reliable. So even like not as good versions of this bike, were still good bikes. Next up we have the Suzuki GSX-R750, the classic iconic sport bike produced from 1985 through today. So we're currently on year 37 for this bike, which is pretty incredible. I was recently at a dealership to ship out my motorcycle from Hawaii here to Oregon, and I talked to this guy for a bit who had just bought a brand new Suzuki GSX-R750, and it looked like a really fun, cool bike. It sounded really good, and he was really excited about it. He really liked it. Obviously, in 37 years, a motorcycle is going to go through quite a few changes from things like carburation to fuel injection, for example, liquid cooling. And the design is almost completely different today compared to the original Gixxer 750s of the 80s. This bike really is one of the most influential sport bikes in history. The inline four, fully fared sport bike really for the average rider, but still, you know, somebody wanting to use it for on the track or just to show off. This was just a great and is still a great lightweight, high powered machine. There's just lots of innovation. This had a really innovative frame design, uh, but there's lots more. The GSX-R750 is without a doubt one of the greatest sort of sport bikes for the people in motorcycling history. Now this one is a bit different in some ways and I kind of feel bad putting it above the GSX-R750 as this has undergone major displacement changes and really just come to define an entire segment for Kawasaki. But anyways, I'm talking about the Kawasaki Ninja. Now the Ninja predates the GSX-R750 by one year. So from 1984 through today, though interestingly enough, there was a form of the Gixxer in Japan prior to the 750 and that's the 400. And that was just one year before as well, both in 1984 but that's beside the point. The first of its kind for the Ninja was the GPZ900R. This really was the bike of the year in 1984, the fastest thing on the road. A 16 valve, double overhead cam. You know, this is a platform that is so iconic in its styling and performance. It's created fanboys all over the world. The Ninja became so much more than just a single sport bike though. There's an entire slew of bikes for riders throughout its last like 38 years or so. From 250cc ninjas that were lightweight and handled really well to the current sort of manic monster Ninja H2, the Ninja name has been putting fear in the hearts of mothers everywhere for 38 years. More could be said, but the Ninja definitely belongs on this list. Unless I'm way off on these sport bikes and I'm missing a bunch of other bikes, then none of these sport bikes belong on this list. But anyways, we'll see if that's true. Next up, we have the BMW GS line. And like the Ninja, I sort of feel bad putting this on here as the GS platform has underwent loads of changes over the past 42 years since 1980 to the point where the original GS was like 40% less capacity than the current generation. Regardless, it's worth noting 
42 years of dad bikes. That's a lot of dad bikes. Seriously though, this is arguably the platform that created what we now know of as the adventure bike. Lots of groundbreaking technology. You probably know that I'm not a huge fan of adventure bikes if you watch my channel a whole lot, but that original GS is pretty gnarly looking. I would definitely ride that thing. I'm not entirely sure why the GS line became such a gigantic whopping motorcycle or why adventure bikes just became such big heavy things. For me, it seems like an 800cc lighter platform like the original GS would be better for the occasional romp off the beaten path. And we are starting to see more popularity in middleweight adventure bikes. Like a Tenere, that, the Tenere 7 or, you know, the Aprilia Touareg, those are adventure bikes that are actually really cool and exciting to me because they're more lightweight and they seem better for going off-road. But maybe the case is that the people who ride BMW GSs, maybe they actually aren't taking these off-road. <laughs> I think that's actually pretty well known that a lot of people aren't using these for going off-road. But regardless, you can't knock BMW here. This bike is absolutely an icon at this point. Okay, now we're getting into the long-running single bikes, not so much entire platforms. And here we've got the classic Honda Goldwing running from 1975 through today. That's 47 years. Now the Goldwing has obviously changed quite a bit since its inception. I mean, it's hardly recognizable compared to the original thing. The current model is a freaking Civic on two wheels at this point. Funny enough though, I was at the dealership recently with my son just sort of running around and he was sitting on like little dirt bikes and stuff. And for some reason he was really excited about the Goldwing that they had there. He really wanted me to sit on it and have him sit on the back of it. And he thought that the foot pegs being these like gigantic platforms, I don't know, he thought that was really cool. It's okay, I'll forgive him. Anyways, the Goldwing is and was the ultimate tour. Honda was already making the best bikes for long trips in the 70s. Like the CB750 was at that time the best thing you could take on a long trip. So this was really the next step forward, significantly more capacity at 1000 cc's and a flat four instead of an inline four. Originally and still a place for Honda to utilize its latest tech, things like shaft drive, water cooling. In the 80s, the bike became a full-blown tourer. It progressively became larger and heavier, which isn't really all bad for this segment. The Goldwing became fuel-injected really early on, like in the mid-80s, luxuriously equipped with cruise control and a radio. But most importantly, this became one of Honda's most reliable motorcycle platforms. And there's a great quote. I'm not sure the reference exactly or what's going on, but somebody was planning to ride a Norton across America or across the world, and he went to his mechanic to prepare the bike, and he asked his mechanic what he should do to get it ready, and the mechanic said something along the lines of, you know, new tires, oil change, and then go trade it in for a Honda Goldwing. Not bad advice. So originally, I had a number five here, which was the Moto Guzzi V7, and I guess I was confused, but sadly I realized that it was actually discontinued for decades, like between the 70s and then its re-release in the 2000s. So yeah, I had to scratch that one. Sorry lads, Moto Guzzi is one of the longest running manufacturers, I believe, but sadly, no V7 on this list, so on to number four. Number four goes to the Harley-Davidson Electroglide. This was a bike that came out in 1965, replacing the Duo and Hydroglide, primarily with the introduction of the electric start. All the way back in 1965, this is one of the earliest big production motorcycles to have an electric start come standard. The Electroglide platform underwent many changes since the 60s, um, like just so many changes. No, I'm kidding. Including but not limited to the iconic Batwing fairing uh, that was not originally on the Electric Glide, and that has almost become synonymous with Harley Davidson and with American touring motorcycles. All of Harley's wonderful engine platforms from Panhead and Shovelhead and whatever head they're using today have all been on this bike. Most of these platforms were nicknamed retrospectively, and I'm thinking we call the current Milwaukee whatever. I say we call it a bucket head. I don't know, I just like that. I think it sounds cool. Panhead, shovelhead, knucklehead, flathead, and buckethead. Anyways, 57 years for this bike, and you know, we've still got Electra classics and classic Electra duo glide ultimates and whatever else. Basically, Harley is still making this bike, and it's still, for the most part, a big heavy old cruiser, which, you know, I can respect that. I think it's pretty cool. Number three goes to the Honda Super Cub, a motorcycle moped thingy that ran from 1958 till today in various forms and in various places. For much of that period, we didn't have this bike here in America, sadly. Regardless, that's 64 years and over 100 million total units and a bunch of cash for Honda to give Marc Marquez to fund all of his destroyed motorcycles. From him high-siding all of their multi-million dollar race machines week in and week out without fail. Just absolutely destroying them. <laughs> a lot could be said about 
about the Super Cub. It definitely had its beautiful iterations. Like today's Honda Super Cub is really nice looking and the original models for sure, but it did get ugly for certain parts of the 80s and 90s. What can be said about this bike that hasn't already been said? I mean, it's one of the most iconic motorcycles of all time and it's the most sold vehicle of all time. Interestingly enough, this bike was a big inspiration for the CG125 that we talked about earlier with its reliable and almost bulletproof push rod engine. The CG went that route instead of the CB's overhead cam. So basically they were looking at the Super Cub and were like, okay, let's see if we can make a motorcycle with this platform that looks a little bit more like a motorcycle and a little less like a scooter. And so it gained all that low end torque and just dead reliability that the Super Cub had. Anyways, Honda Super Cub, one of the greatest motorcycles of all time and of course one of the longest running as well. Speaking of push rods, number two goes to the Harley Davidson Sportster running for a total of about 65 years from 57 through today. Harley sort of killed the Sportster for like a year or so. I mean, some would say it's still dead with the current Sportster no longer repping an air-cooled pushrod engine. You know, it's now utilizing that RevMax double overhead cam platform. Is this a Sportster? You know, that's an interesting topic. I mean, the Goldwing is so different than its original model, but it's still a Goldwing, and Goldwing fanatics would point to the 80s as the real Goldwings, but even those bikes are quite different from their origin. Regardless, the Sportster is, for me, the real American muscle bike, a true roadster. The Sportster was relatively unchanged through its, you know, 60 or so year run where it didn't really change at all. I believe the first year for the Shovelhead was the 57 Sportster, and man, that engine was around for a really long time, all the way through 85, and then the second major change and really only major design change was the switch to the Evo engine in 86. Besides that, it's the new sports dress with the RevMax engine, which is arguably just as big of a change as the change in 86. Time will tell if this platform has the kind of long standingness if that's a word, as the two other platforms. Regardless, the Sportster here in America is almost synonymous with American motorcycling besides like riding a big cruiser. So like when I tell people, especially where I'm from in the Midwest, if I'm saying I'm going to go get a motorcycle just to like commute or just to ride around on, immediately people are like, oh, so a Sportster. People really say that. Believe it or not, people in the States don't really, (laughs) like a lot of them don't know much else in terms of street bikes. And, you know, I guess that's a good thing for Harley, but they have no idea what a Triumph or they don't even realize like Honda still makes motorcycles (laughs) and like everybody in the world rides them. Anyways, I have a feeling if I showed those people a picture of a new Sportster, they'd be like, what the hell is that? Like, I don't even think a lot of people would recognize it as a Sportster. So anyways, Harley Davidson Sportster, definitely one of the longest running models. First place on our list goes to, you probably guessed it. The Royal Enfield Bullet, 72 years or more in production from 48 to 2020. I still can't believe they killed the Bullet in 2020. Like, what the heck? But it's all in the name, honestly. The Bullet is still technically around in Royal Enfield's small displacement singles. Uh, But the name is gone at this point, and the essential look that it had isn't there. Like, the classic 500 and 350, they don't look quite like the Bullet did. If the Sportster is synonymous with American street riding, the Bullet is definitely that for places like India. Technically speaking, the name actually goes back even further into the 1930s, but 48 is really the year where we see this platform that would essentially stay the same for most of its run. Originally, the Bullet was quite the innovative machine. For example, it was the first British motorcycle to rep a rear swing arm. And, you know, it was updated minimally, almost less and less updating as time went on with the bike. And, you know, as motorcycling sort of changed rapidly through the 80s and 90s and 2000s, this bike just did something that almost no other motorcycle would do. Like, it just stayed basically the same, especially in terms of styling. Like, they just never strayed away from what this bike looked like, and they didn't really want to take a whole lot of chances. It's a bike that stayed classic forever. So you buy a 1960s bullet, you buy a 1980s bullet, you buy an early 2000s bullet. They're not very different. They are basically the same motorcycle, which I think is pretty cool. All right, let me know what you guys think. Uh, Let me know, again, if I'm wrong about any of these, or maybe if there's some that I missed that could be slotted into this list. It's entirely possible that I missed a big one, and that would be funny if I did. So just let me know. I'll be happy to admit it. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you in the next one. Ride safe.